windward shores of Oahu capture the trade winds that blow from the northeast throughout most of the year. So it's not a surprise that these shores are also home to some of the island's best windsurfing and kitesurfing spots. And of these spots, the most popular one is right here at Kailua Bay. If you look closely, you may be able to see in the background a couple of those kite surfers. Now here on the windward side, the wind blows hard, and the rain does come often, and this is one of the most beautiful places on earth I have ever seen. I may not be able to draw a picture like this, but I did my best to draw up some nice phase diagrams, which is what today's lecture is all about. Today we look at phase diagrams. A phase diagram is a graphical representation of the phases that a substance is found in under different conditions. And the conditions that we're interested in are the temperature and the pressure. But before we do that, let's first reiterate some of the basic knowledge that we've discussed regarding the three phases of matter, as well as the six possible phase transitions that can occur. Here is a representation of some generic solid. And in a solid, the particles are nicely ordered, and that's because they're held locked together because of the interaction forces that exist between the particles. Now, to convert a solid into a liquid, where the particles have the freedom to slide around past one another, one of two things can be done. One, the temperature can be increased, and two, the pressure can be varied. We've discussed the temperature effects a little more, so let's recall those. As you warm up a solid or you increase its temperature, remember what you're really doing is you're increasing the molecular motion of the particles in the solid because that's what temperature is. It's a measure of the amount of molecular motion that's occurring in the particles that we cannot see but which is always happening. So raising the temperature of a solid means the particles are now shaking around a little more. And when the temperature is raised up to the melting temperature, the particles are shaking around just enough to break free from those locking interaction forces. And that's how a solid can melt into a liquid. Similarly, cooling a liquid back down means slowing those particles back down and the interaction forces take over and the liquid will freeze back into a solid. But another way the transition can occur is by changing the pressure. And you can imagine that if you increase the surrounding pressure of a liquid, what you're really doing is you're pressing the particles closer together and you can sort of press them together just enough to lock them together into the configuration of a solid. And that's what happens for most substances. As you increase the pressure, you will freeze the liquid back into a solid. We'll see water is an exception. Water has the opposite effect. But most substances, increasing the surrounding pressure will cause freezing. And as you release or decrease the surrounding pressure, you can cause melting. Now, a less discussed phase transition is between the solid and the gas phase. This might be less familiar because we don't see it happening for water. We always see water going from solid to liquid and then to gas. But sometimes, under certain conditions, solids can sublime directly into the gas phase. Now, you've probably seen dry ice where this occurs. And what dry ice is, it's a piece of solid carbon dioxide that vaporizes directly into the gas phase. And as far as temperature effects, as the solid warms up, the particles have more molecular motion, thermal energy, and that's how sublimation can occur. And if you cool the gas particles back down, they will redeposit back onto the surface of the solid that's deposition. Now the pressure effects, you can probably imagine 
that increasing the surrounding pressure of the gas will press those particles closer together and you can also have deposition occurring that way as well. And if you release the surrounding pressure, if you decrease the pressure around the solid, sublimation can occur as well. Now the liquid and gas transition we discussed in pretty good detail in our previous lecture. And you should recall that increasing the temperature of a liquid will cause the particles to you know, shake around more and eventually as the temperature is increased enough up to the boiling temperature, the particles will completely separate into the gas phase. And if you cool those gas particles back down, they'll recondense back into the liquid. You should remember that vaporization does not necessarily mean boiling. And that's because of the distribution of molecular velocities, the Boltzmann distribution. So if you need to refresh yourself, take a look at the previous lecture. But increasing the temperature of a liquid basically means turning it into the gas. And decreasing the temperature of the gas means recondensing it back into the liquid. So what are the pressure effects here? Well, we discussed vapor pressure in our previous lecture. But what you can imagine here is that if you increase the surrounding pressure around the gas, you will cause the particles to become closer together and that will make them turn back into the liquid. And if you release the surrounding pressure, or if you decrease the surrounding pressure around the liquid, you can cause vaporization to occur that way as well. So temperature and pressure both play a role here. When you increase the temperature, that means you're increasing the molecular motion. So that can cause phase transitions. And similarly, as you increase the pressure, what you're doing is you're bringing particles closer together. That can cause phase transitions as well. A phase diagram is basically a graph that tells you what phase you should find a substance in under different conditions. And in chemistry, the conditions that we're interested in are normally the temperature and the pressure. So in other words, if you have a certain temperature and pressure and you want to know what phase the substance is found in at that temperature and pressure, you should be able to look at the phase diagram. So for instance, at 50 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, if you look at the phase diagram for water, it should say that water is a liquid at that temperature and pressure. But the phase diagram for carbon dioxide would tell you that it's a gas. So every substance is different and therefore should have a different phase diagram. But if we study one phase diagram of a generic substance, we should learn something about all substances and all phase diagrams because they have certain features in common. And that's just what we're gonna do. We're gonna study the phase diagram for a generic substance before we look at any specific substances. Let's first take a look at the formal definition of a phase diagram. It's a map of the phase of a substance as a function of temperature plotted on the x-axis and pressure plotted on the y-axis. So here is a representative phase diagram of some generic substance. We don't know what it is. But most of them look like this, more or less. And you see pressure plotted on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Now what we should be able to do, again, is pick a certain temperature and pressure and identify what phase the substance is in. So at this temperature and this pressure, it should be a liquid. At other temperatures and pressures, you might have a gas or solid, or perhaps you might just pick a temperature and pressure that happens to fall right on the dividing line. So the regions in this diagram represent the phases. You have your solid region, your liquid region, your gas region. And the lines that separate the phases represent phase transitions. 
it represents where the phases are in equilibrium with each other. So at this point right here, the liquid and the gas will coexist. Now, the lines have names. This line, which separates the solid from the liquid phase, is called the melting curve, because that's where a solid is in equilibrium with liquid when it melts. And you could also call it the freezing curve. This line right here, where liquid is in equilibrium with gas, is called the vaporization curve, or the boiling curve, perhaps the condensation curve as well. And this one, which separates solid from the gas phase, down here, at low pressures and temperatures, is called the sublimation curve, or the deposition curve. Now, there are a couple of interesting points in this diagram. The most obvious one is probably this one, where all three of these lines intersect. And also, all three of these regions meet. This is called the triple point. And the triple point is that special temperature and pressure, that unique temperature and pressure, where all three phases coexist. And not only that, all three, all six phase transitions can occur. So if you observe a substance at its triple point, at that unique temperature and pressure, you should not only see solid, liquid, and gas phases, but you should see boiling, condensation, melting, freezing, sublimation, and deposition all occurring at the same time. It's kind of interesting and strange. We normally don't observe substances at their triple point under normal conditions, but under certain laboratory conditions you can see that, and it is pretty interesting. Another point is way out here at high temperature and pressure, and this is called the critical point. If a substance is at a very high temperature and very high pressure, you may have what's called a supercritical fluid. And that's sort of like a combination of the liquid and gas phase. In fact, if the temperature is higher than the critical temperature and the pressure is higher than the critical pressure, then you cannot distinguish between the liquid and the gas phase. And you call that a supercritical fluid. It's out here in this region up here. Uh, we'll take a closer look at what a supercritical fluid is like here in a moment. But first, let's look at a few more features regarding this generic phase diagram. These lines represent the points where the phases are in equilibrium with each other. So this line right here represents the points where the liquid is in equilibrium with the gas. And if you remember, in our previous lecture, we saw a situation where the liquid is in equilibrium with the gas, the vapor pressure situation. Remember, if you pour a liquid into a container and seal it, that liquid will establish a certain vapor pressure in the little region of space above the liquid, that little gaseous region. And the liquid will be vaporizing at the same rate at which it is condensing, and so the vapor pressure up there will remain relatively constant. And in that case, the liquid is in equilibrium with the gas. So this curve right here is sometimes called the vapor pressure curve. And hopefully you remember that that curve is not a linear curve, that it's actually described by the Clapeyron equation. And the Clapeyron equation tells us that the vapor pressure increases exponentially with the temperature. So if that's kind of hazy, that's okay. You can go back and look at that previous lecture. But basically, a liquid is in equilibrium with the gas, and as you increase the temperature, the pressure at which that occurs, that equilibrium occurs, also increases, and the relationship is an exponential one. Now, a couple of ways to read this phase diagram, which might make it easier to understand it, would be to hold, or suppose you're holding the substance 
at a constant pressure and observe what happens when you change the temperature or hold the substance at a constant temperature and observe what happens as you change the pressure. So first let's try holding the pressure constant and just to make things simple we'll suppose that the substance is being held at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. So normal atmospheric conditions here. Now we know that at very low temperatures substances are generally found in the solid phase. And as you increase the temperature eventually you'll get to that point where a substance will usually melt into the liquid phase and so you would call that the normal melting point. Some substances might go directly from the solid to the gas phase under normal atmospheric conditions but usually a substance will go from solid to liquid and then if you continue to increase the temperature of the liquid at normal pressure, one atmosphere, then eventually the liquid will transition into the gas. It will boil and this is called the normal boiling point. Now similarly you could ask how the phase of a substance changes if you hold the temperature constant and you change the pressure. So suppose you have a gas that is at a certain temperature, maybe down here somewhere, and you hold the temperature constant but you increase the pressure. Now you remember a gas, the particles are far apart from one another. If you increase the pressure, what you're really doing is you're squeezing those particles closer together and you could really squeeze the particles so close together that you could cause that gas to condense into a liquid. Now similarly, you could do the same thing with a liquid. If you have a liquid, say right here, kind of near the melting curve and you hold the temperature constant and you increase the pressure, you remember liquid particles are kind of sliding around one another and if you increase the pressure, if you squeeze those particles together, you might actually squeeze them together just enough to sort of lock them in place into the configuration of a solid. And that's what most substances do. You can increase the pressure and cause freezing to occur, make the liquid turn into a solid. And under different conditions you could cause sublimation and deposition as well. Just to reiterate, the triple point is that temperature and pressure where all three phases coexist and all six phase transitions occur as well. And also the critical point is the temperature and pressure, usually very high temperature and pressure, above which the liquid and gas phases are one and the same. When you're in this region up here, you cannot distinguish whether the substance is a liquid or a gas. It's called a supercritical fluid and it behaves very strangely. And if you want to imagine what a supercritical fluid is like, uh, consider the following thought experiment, if you will. You pour the substance into this container and you leave a little space up here above and then you seal that container. Now we know that the substance will establish a certain vapor pressure. So the liquid will be in equilibrium with the gas up here. So there will be a few gas particles in this space above. Now if we were to heat up the liquid down here, we'll cause the vapor pressure to increase and more of the gas will vaporize up there. And the concentration of gas particles is becoming greater. The gas particles are getting kind of crowded up here because they're not allowed to escape. If we continue to heat the liquid up, you can imagine what happens if it sort of all is vaporized but the gas particles are so concentrated at this point that they have the density as basically a liquid. It's kind of like a gas but kind of like a liquid and it behaves very strangely. It's like a very very dense gas but you can't really call it a gas and you can't really call it a liquid and so you call it a supercritical fluid. And it's kind of like the particles are behaving like gas particles but they're so dense. 
And supercritical fluids are very interesting and very odd and peculiar. So we won't really see them too much in this course, but that's what you might imagine one to be like. To better understand a phase diagram, it will help if we compare the phase diagrams of two common substances, water and carbon dioxide. But before we do that, let's first recall the structures of these two compounds. Carbon dioxide has this linear structure where the oxygen atoms are surrounding the carbon atoms and they're pointing in opposite directions. So these molecules exhibit dispersion interactions only. Water, on the other hand, we recall is able to hydrogen bond. And so the water molecules of a solid piece of ice are nicely ordered. And these hydrogen bonds, in fact, are best felt when the distance between the hydrogen of one atom and the oxygen of the other atom is 200 picometers, or two angstroms. So in solid ice, water molecules tend to sort of spread out in order to maximize the strength of the hydrogen bonds. So let's take a look at the phase diagram of carbon dioxide now. There are a few important differences between carbon dioxides and water's phase diagram. And the first one is the location of the triple point. The triple point for carbon dioxide occurs at a pressure of 5.1 atmospheres and temperature of negative 57 degrees Celsius. But the main thing to notice here is the pressure. It's above atmospheric pressure. So for carbon dioxide under atmospheric conditions of one atmosphere, we see the solid can pass directly into the gas phase. And you probably remember that dry ice is actually carbon dioxide in the solid form subliming into the gas phase. Now to better understand sublimation, let's look at this little diagram of the sublimation of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide's solid exhibits a certain vapor pressure. Solids do have a vapor pressure like liquids do, except it's normally much lower than the vapor pressure of the liquid. However, carbon dioxide is an exception. Carbon dioxide solid exhibits a pretty high vapor pressure compared to most other substances. And the reason for that is related to its weak dispersion interactions. So the molecules here at the surface are able to escape more readily because they're not held as tightly by the dispersion forces. And so the concentration of gas particles up here is pretty concentrated. And this equilibrium that occurs between the gas phase and the solid phase is actually a description of the vapor pressure of solid carbon dioxide. Now, if we were to increase the temperature of carbon dioxide by, say, taking a piece of dry ice and letting it sit out in the room and it will warm up, the vapor pressure also increases, just like it does for a liquid. And so this little vapor pressure curve for the solid actually is pretty similar to the vapor pressure curve for the liquid, and it's even described by an equation that looks strikingly similar to the Clapeyron equation, which describes it for a liquid. So the solid's vapor pressure does increase with temperature. And when the solid is raised up to a temperature at which its vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, that's where you'll see sublimation occur. So if you take a piece of dry ice and you let it sit out in the room, it will warm up 
And when it warms up to the point where its vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, you will see it really subliming. Now another thing to notice for carbon dioxide is the shape of the melting curve. It is a positively oriented curve. And the way you want to understand that is by the following. If you have liquid carbon dioxide, maybe at these conditions right here, and you increase the pressure while keeping the temperature constant, you see that it will transition into the solid phase. Now this should make some sense, because if you have a liquid where the particles have the freedom to slide around, and you increase the pressure, you can imagine increasing the pressure brings particles closer together, and you can imagine pressing those particles so close together that you're locking them together in the configuration of a solid. So increasing the pressure can cause freezing to occur for carbon dioxide. Now one more thing about carbon dioxide's phase diagram. This region up here, which we remember is a supercritical fluid, the supercritical fluid for carbon dioxide actually has an important industrial application. Those of you coffee drinkers, if you ever like to enjoy decaffeinated coffee, well, there's a pretty good chance that you may have had your coffee in contact with supercritical carbon dioxide at one point. Because supercritical carbon dioxide is able to selectively dissolve caffeine molecules while leaving the rest of the molecules, for the most part, untouched. And so if you take a bunch of coffee beans and you soak them in supercritical carbon dioxide, it will dissolve out the caffeine and leave the rest of the stuff, for the most part, alone. And so you can take your coffee beans and grind them up and it will be decaffeinated coffee. So kind of interesting that supercritical fluids do actually have an important use. Now let's take a look at the phase diagram for water. Pretty similar in several respects. You have your solid, liquid, and gas phase over there and your supercritical fluid up there. But a couple of important differences are, the first being the location of the triple point. You see, for water, the triple point is below one atmosphere. And so under normal atmospheric conditions, we do not see sublimation occur. We see solid melting into liquid and the liquid boiling into gas under normal atmospheric conditions. If you wanted to see sublimation occur for water, the pressure would have to be below 0.1 atmosphere. So these scales are not drawn to scale. The triple point is actually very close to the x-axis. It was just elevated for you so you could see it. Now, the other important difference between water's phase diagram and carbon dioxide's is the shape of the melting curve. You see, water has a negative slope in its melting curve. And what that means is if you have some solid water and you increase the pressure while keeping the temperature constant, you will cause melting to occur. Well, that shouldn't be too much of a surprise because you remember solid water, the particles are nicely spread out in order to maximize those hydrogen bond interactions. And if you increase the pressure, if you cram those particles closer together, you will break those hydrogen bonds and the particles will then be able to slide past one another. So liquid water molecules are actually a little bit closer together than the solid ice particles which are spread out because of the hydrogen bonds. Liquid water, the molecules are closer together and therefore it's a little bit more dense. So increasing the pressure of solid ice you can cram it into a liquid. And perhaps you remember an ice skater is able to glide across the ice. 
Well, the reason that happens is because those ice blades are exhibiting a very high pressure on the surface of the ice right below the blade. And it's actually causing a little bit of melting to occur right below the blade. And so the blade is gliding across liquid water. And that provides lubrication, and that's how an ice skater is able to skate across the ice. Because that extremely high pressure exerted on the ice is causing a little bit of melting to occur down there. An ice skater would not be able to skate across dry ice. <laughs> but water, yes. Now one more interesting thing regarding water. Way up here, at extremely high pressures of several hundred atmospheres, solid water takes on a different type of configuration, a different type of structure. And you call that ice too. Now we are not going to look at the molecular structure of ice too, but it is different than regular ice. And even higher pressures, there are even other structures, ice 3, ice 4, 5, and so on. So, kind of interesting, little tidbit of information about water. So that concludes our discussion of phase diagrams. I hope you were able to learn something new. In our next lecture, we will take a detour and focus on solid structures, the nice crystal lattice configuration of a solid structure. We'll talk about this nicely ordered configuration of the solid particles. So join me for that. Aloha.